I'm Jim Falk, and thanks so much for joining us this morning. You know, when I hear our World Affairs theme song, I just have to smile, and I, I need to thank uh, Zach Harmon. He's our chief financial officer and uh, also a professional blues singer. So it's, it's great that our World Affairs Council of Dallas-Fort Worth has our own uh, theme song. Uh, very pleased today that you could join us with our program featuring Dr. Rebecca Lesner. And, uh, you know, uh, Rebecca, uh, when we do programs with the Global Forum, uh, it's a smaller group. They are our highest level donors and really tremendous friends of the World Affairs Council. And uh, I want to let all of, all of them know that last night I had the opportunity to uh, jump onto a Zoom call with about 100 high school students from all across the Metroplex. And they were having a special workshop on genocide. And there were professors from a number of area universities. Uh, I couldn't listen to the whole program, but I did hear the presentation from a professor at the University of Texas at Dallas and heard several of the questions coming from the students. I mentioned this because I want all of you to know how important your support is and that you're making possible uh, programs like this that are so important, especially when we are in this uh, strange virtual environment. Speaking of that, uh, I, I think I'm probably like you, uh, quite cautiously optimistic that uh, probably by next June or a little bit later, uh, we'll really be back together in person. And we're all looking forward to that. Yesterday, uh, I joined a, a call with Alana and Kate and some others on our staff talking about upcoming programs that we'll have for you, Global Forum members. And in fact, uh, Alana just earlier this morning was talking to a chef at one of our favorite restaurants. And so we're gonna be doing things from behind the scenes, uh, exhibition tours, uh, cooking, cooking uh, programs, uh, as well as some really engaging and important programs on uh, global policy, public policy. So again, thanks for being with us. So over the past four years, the perception of US foreign policy, I think you would agree has been based around the idea of the Trump administration's pillar of America first. And while in, in practice, this probably has not always been the case, perceptions certainly matter. Our guest today maintains that the way to effectively advance and meet today's geopolitical and technological challenges is through what she and her co-author, Mir Rapp Hooper, describe as a grand strategy of openness. Uh, Rebecca Listener's book, uh, I had the opportunity to read it uh, just a few weeks ago, and uh, I really encourage you to uh, take a look at this book, and you can purchase in Open World, How America Can Win the Contest, for 21st century order by going to your local bookstore, or I hope you'll go to enterabangbooks.com where you'll get a 10% discount. Let me just reach behind and, and look at the book, hold it because uh, you know you often see blurbs behind books on the, on the back cover, but uh, rarely do you see blurbs like this. Jim Mattis, mandatory reading at a moment of unprecedented change and upheaval uh, Rap Hooper and Listener provide fresh thinking and a clear guide for United States leadership in a renewed and open 21st century international order. Dr. Henry Kissinger, this work is a crucial co contribution to the most important conversation of our time. So speaking of conversations, I'm going to be counting on all of you to uh, send in your questions into the Q&A box and uh, knowing that you're Global Forum members, I know that you'll have a lot of really good questions. Let me also take this opportunity uh, to, oh, I do need to mention that when you purchase your copy of uh, Open World through Interabang, be sure to type in the code DFW World. And what a great time to purchase not just an Open World, but lots of books. And any book in your shopping cart, again, only online, will receive that 10% discount. Let me thank our sponsor of our, our global forum, and that's Billingsley Company. We're very grateful to Lucy and Henry for their support. And today's program sponsor is one of our new directors, Gary Wollins. Uh, Gary, thank you so much. And special thanks to our promotional partners, the Yale Alumni Club of Dallas and the Georgetown Alumni Club of Dallas-Fort Worth. Uh, we have lots of programs in store for you in 2021. To keep up with them, just go to dfwworld.org 
And if you've not yet subscribed to our YouTube channel, I hope you'll do that today by going to YouTube and type in DFW World. So let me just stress that Rebecca Listener is speaking today in her private capacity and not as a representative of the Naval War College or the United States government. Uh, she's an assistant professor in uh, the Strategic and Operational Research Department at the U.S. Naval War College. She received her B.A. from Harvard and her M.A. and doctorate from Georgetown University. Uh, she was, has been a research fellow at the University of Pennsylvania's Perry World House, uh, also a Stanton Nuclear Security Fellow, and has been a fellow at the Council on Foreign Relations not just once but twice, uh, working with someone that all of you have heard before, and that's uh, James Lindsay. And she's also a fellow with Yale University's International Security Studies Department. So Rebecca, great to have you with us. Thanks so much for taking time. Well, Jim, thank you so much for having me. Thank you for that incredibly generous introduction and plug for the book. And also thanks to everyone who's here today for all of the support that you do for this really terrific programming. I'm a great admirer of the organization and really delighted to be with all of you and looking forward to this conversation. Well, thank you, thank you. And before we really talk about your book, um, in, in doing some research, and I have to thank our interns for uh, providing a, a little briefing for me as well, I uh, saw that you wrote an article um, back in 2016 uh, before uh, uh, President Trump was inaugurated. And, and the title was, it was An Easy Way to Avoid Foreign Policy Mishaps. I'm not asking you to comment on what you might know really about today's transition, but why are transitions so, uh, so key, pivotal? It's such an important question, Jim, and something that's, of course, top of mind right now for so many of us as we observe the transfer of power, uh, such as it is this time between outgoing President Donald Trump and incoming President-elect Joe Biden. And the important thing to remember is that presidential transitions are the most perilous moment in American politics under whatever circumstances. They are a time when an incoming administration has to seize control of the vast US federal government, taking control of everything from ongoing foreign military operations, covert operations, counterterrorism operations, to America's nuclear weapons, to in this case, pandemic response, response to climate change, response to an economic attack catastrophe and ongoing civil unrest and racial strife within our own country. And at the same time, they also have to staff up the entire federal government because our executive branch is comprised of about 4,000 political appointees of whom 1,200 require Senate confirmation. So this is really a Herculean task. And as I argue in that 2016 article, this is the reason why incoming administrations need to work as hard as they possibly can to get up to speed on everything the federal government is doing so that they can hit the ground running the very moment when a new president takes the of office and therefore assumes responsibility for all of those tasks I just mentioned. But it's also the reason why an outgoing administration really ought to dedicate the entirety of its own energies to ensuring the success of its successor, because the, the success of Biden in this case really is the nation's success. So, you know, the, the, the time period between um, the election day and, and inaugural day, inauguration day is 73 days. Is that enough time? I mean, when you think back, I mean, originally, you, inauguration of the new president wasn't until March, so it's shorter than it used to be. But uh, what, what do they have enough time, even if things are working well? It's a great question. And of course, it hasn't always been this way. And if you look at other countries, you know, some of them, especially those with parliamentary systems, while their government turns over, they have basically momentary transitions right after an election might happen. So there's a lot of variation in terms of how leadership transfers happen. I think 73 days is a short amount of time, although that doesn't necessarily mean that we would want it to be longer. What it does mean is that every moment counts. And frankly, that's why the Trump administration's refusal to ascertain the transition for several weeks after Joe Biden had clearly won the election was a mistake. It set back this transition in this case in a way that I think the Biden administration will be working to recover from the entire time. And here we need only look back to, for example, the findings of the 9-11 Commission, which cited the delayed transition into the George W. Bush administration as one of the things that did set back the Bush administration and perhaps contributed to the intelligence failure 
that allowed 9-11 to occur. Now, that's not the only example of information that might not have been effectively transmitted during a transition period. There are others as well. When the presidency tra uh, transitioned from Jimmy Carter to Ronald Reagan, the knowledge that Israel intended to strike the Osirak nuclear reactor in Iraq was actually lost in the transition, and it therefore took the Reagan administration by surprise. Carter himself learned about secret CIA payments to Jordan from the Washington Post, rather from Gerald Ford. George W. Bush, when he came in beyond the 9-11 example, was somewhat blindsided on his first foreign trip to Mexico by a number of airstrikes that happened in Iraq under a set of rules of engagement that had been established by the Clinton administration that the new team didn't fully understand. So these are a number of national security examples of why it is so vital that information be transmitted to the full extent possible during this very brief period that allows us to transmit all the institutional knowledge that's necessary for one administration to take over from the next. Despite the delay, are, are you hearing and you feel that things are going fairly well now in, in so far at least uh, as we talk about national security transition? Certainly, it seems to be going better than it was before, but there continue to be troubling reports that certain forms of access, including in the national security space, like at the Department of Defense, are being denied. The way that it tends to work is that a transition team designates what are called agency review teams. They are experts who typically have deep subject matter expertise and expertise in the different departments and agencies who basically serve as landing teams. They go into these agencies, they try to understand what's been done, what's been tried, what's failed, what's ongoing right now, who knows what, um, who are the key people that might need to stay on into a new administration. And what's happening now, according to press reports, is that in some cases, the Trump team is not uh, offering full access to those agency review teams that are representing the Biden-Harris team. And what that creates is a risk of information loss and the types of information loss that could hinder the Biden's administration's uh, ability to take responsibility for the whole national security complex, could hinder the Biden administration's ability to you know, really take up vaccine distribution and other elements of COVID response, could hinder its diplomacy. You think about the Biden team not knowing what has necessarily been promised and said to both allies and adversaries over the past four years. Um, so I don't think that the level of cooperation is up to the standard that it must be. But the fact that, for example, President-elect Biden and President, uh, Vice President-elect Harris are now receiving the President's Daily Brief, the complement of intelligence that's delivered to the President and his senior most advisors every morning, that type of thing is certainly a step in the right direction. So one of our members, Jan de Mulder, asked, given the current messy transition, many are advocating, we touched on this, but he asked it this way, many advocate we should drastically shorten the transition period. Could it be done? What if it were two weeks? And who would make the decision to do that? I, I, I should know, but I don't know what was required to shorten it from March to, to January 20th. So I believe it's a matter of legislation, and I don't think that it should be dramatically shortened because, again, the, the scale of the task is just so vast. I mean, again, thinking just about the personnel it, side of it. The incoming Biden team has to fill 4,000 slots. And any of you who've tried to hire people in your own businesses and organizations know how hard it is to vet candidates, to identify the right person for the right slot. And so that's a really massive task. And I think only two weeks would be not nearly enough time. I mean, you think about the Department of Defense alone. It's the nation's largest employer and by many accounts, the world's most complex organization. So if you think about you know, a company like Walmart or Exxon, simply, you know, firing one CEO and bringing in a new team one or two weeks later. I mean, that's not nearly enough time for the types of handover that you would want in order to build a strong executive team to ensure the transmission of information. So no, I don't think that it should be shorter. Now, I do think that there is a question about whether the norm surrounding presidential transitions should be institutionalized further. There has been substantial progress over the past several decades, and especially over the past decade decade in turning a lot of these informal expectations about the types of services an outgoing administration would provide to an incoming administration from norms into laws. There was a major reform to the Presidential Transition Act that happened 
in 2011 that codified many of the ways in which the federal government is now legally required to support an incoming administration during this crucial transition period. But what I think we're seeing right now, as with so many things during the Trump years, is that laws only go so far and the intent and the will to fulfill the spirit of the law and not just the letter of the law matters a great deal. And so that's where I think the continued hindered access, hindered information sharing, uh, hindered cooperation, the attempt to lock in policy priorities on the way out. I mean, these are all things that are technically allowed under the law, but often have been normatively prohibited. And I think perhaps Congress should look at further institutionalizing some of these expectations for what a cooperative transition of power ought to look like. Well, we're going to come back to any questions that people may have about some of the issues that are going to uh, be on uh, President Biden's desk on, on January 20th. But I'd like now to turn to your book. And I think one thing that our, our viewers should know is that you would have written this book uh, even if President, despite, may I say, uh, President Trump's administration and some of the steps he's taken in foreign policy, why did you and your co-author feel it was so important to, to really come up with a, a new approach of U.S. foreign policy? That's absolutely right, Jim. So our book, An Open World, really makes the case that the United States has an opportunity to reimagine its foreign policy for a post-pandemic, post-Trump world before it is too late. And we actually started this book in the immediate wake of the 2016 election, when it was already clear to us that much as so much of the foreign policy cognoscenti were really focused on the influence of Donald Trump himself on America's role in the world, we saw him as more of an avatar than an architect of the massive domestic and international changes that were upending American foreign policy. Because the fact is that even if Hillary Clinton had won in 2016, she too would have had to contend with the rise of China, with rapid technological change, and with worsening domestic political dysfunction within the United States. So even as it certainly is my view that Donald Trump's presidency has worsened America's global standing, it's important to realize that it is not solely responsible for the collapse of American influence overseas and failures of international cooperation of the kind that we've seen over the course of this year. So what we ultimately argue is that to build back better, in Joe Biden's words, after both Trump and COVID, the U.S. really needs a new approach. It needs an approach that is both disciplined and globally engaged, and one that sets out to defend what we call an open world. So just to sort of set the framework, I think we all believe we know what a liberal international order is, but why don't you define it for us and, and how you see it? Um, and, and how you discuss it in your book. Sure. So one of the key arguments of the book is that actually the liberal international order, as we've known it, especially in the post-Cold War era, is in many ways a thing of the past. So international orders always reflect power, and power has been shifting for quite some time now. So it follows, therefore, that international order should change, too. Now, what is international order? It's sort of a term of art. It's kind of a piece of jargon that foreign policy thinkers often use. And it basically re uh, refers to the set of laws, international laws, norms, and institutions that structure cooperation between states. And like I said, international order always reflects the underlying distribution of power. So some elements of what people call the liberal international order emerged with the end of World War II, when the United States led in the founding of organizations like the UN and the Bretton Woods Institution. But as the Iron Curtain fell, many of the liberal components of international order actually receded within the Western Bloc. And the United States layered upon organizations like NATO and some of its other alliances. In some cases, it worked with the Soviet Union to create new forms of international cooperation, like the Non-Proliferation Treaty and the Non-Proliferation Regime, and so on. And of course, with decolonization, the international order had to evolve to bring in new countries and regions. And in the 1970s, that initial Bretton Woods system collapsed with the end of the gold standard, and the international economic order had to be reborn. But it was really only with the fall of the Soviet Union and the advent of what some call the unipolar moment, when the United States emerged really as the world's unrivaled superpower, that the United States came to feel that it could actually propagate a truly liberal and truly international order, that is to spread liberal politics and liberal markets to all corners of the globe. 
And that was the wager of American grand strategy for much of the post-Cold War era. But the problem is that that vision has now foundered. We now know that uh, the architecture of international cooperation that was built fundamentally for the challenges and opportunities of the 1940s is not suited to the challenges and the opportunities of the 2040s. And what is more, the increasing rivalry between the United States and China and to a lesser extent between the United States and Russia, as well as the emergence of these new issues like globalization, the inequalities that stem from globalization, new technologies, climate change, none of those are sufficiently covered by the set of international order structures that we have right now. So our argument is that the, inter the liberal international order as we've known it is really a thing of the past and we now need to turn our attention to what comes next. And so now discuss what you all are proposing, which is this concept of openness. Sure. So basically an openness strategy is a new foreign policy vision that will allow the United States to defend its dearest interests and values, even though we are no longer the world's unrivaled superpower. And it recognizes fundamentally that the United States can only stay safe, secure, and prosperous in an open world. So what exactly is an open world? Well, first, in an open world, all states should be able to make free and independent political choices without foreign interference in their domestic electoral processes, and of course, without outright domination by any hostile foreign state. Second, international waterways, airspace, and outer space must all remain open and accessible for commercial and military transit which means that a country like China should not be able to close off the South China Sea, much as Iran should not be able to close off the Straits of Hormuz. And third, in an open world, global cooperation and trade should proceed through international institutions that are governed transparently and modernized for 21st century challenges. And the important thing to remember in the way in which in many ways this vision of openness is a departure from the vision of universal liberalism that has guided American strategy for much of the past few decades, the universal liberalism that we were just talking about a moment ago, is that the United States actually does not need to dominate the world militarily in order to achieve this vision of an open world. What it needs to do is it needs to prevent other countries from dominating the world while joining with like-minded allies and partners to build powerful coalitions for international openness. So when we talk about other countries, and clearly right now, it, we think about China. How does China fit into this, into your equation? So China, in many ways, is the reason why the United States role in the world and international position has fundamentally changed. Because the fact is that the rise of China means that the United States is no longer the world's unrivaled superpower, but in many ways American foreign policy has not adapted to this new position. Now China has experienced a meteoric economic growth over the past several decades, and its military power has expanded in parallel. We know that China is now the world's largest economy by some measures. And for example, its shipbuilding has proceeded at a pace that rapidly eclipses that of the United States. But even though the United, the China rose within an international system that the United States dominated, China now wants to change the rules of 21st century international politics to better reflect its own preferences, its own interests, and to protect the Chinese Communist Party's authoritarian regime. So what this means is that we've entered a new era of geopolitics that many have come to call great power competition. The United States now has to contend with a powerful rival in China that will not only compete with the US militarily in Asia, but will also challenge the United States economically, commercially, and technologically around the world. But even as China is a formidable competitor, it's important not to count out the United States because the United States remains exceptionally powerful. We still have a tremendous system of alliances, the likes of which no other country can boast. We have a dominant dollar that is still the global reserve currency and viewed as one of the safest assets in the world. We still have a tremendous engine of domestic innovation as evidenced by the fact that the United States effectively won the COVID vaccine race. And we still have the most powerful military in the world, the only military capable of projecting power around the world. 
So what this means is that the United States remains immensely capable of protecting its interests and values, even in a world of great power competition, but it can only do so if it adopts the right strategy. Two, two thoughts on this. One, um, in recent, especially over the last two or three years, China has been very strategic and quite effective in increasing its presence and leadership with a number of UN agencies. And it doesn't seem like they'd be willing to, to give that up. Secondly, and I'm not trying to put you on the spot if you don't have all these figures in your, in your head, but I just was reading in either in your book or one of the articles that you were quoted in about uh, the strength and growth of China's Navy as well as its Coast Guard, which I was not aware of what it was doing with its, its, its uh, specifically the Coast Guard. Sure, those are both really important points and phenomena to point out. And here I would say, look, for all the reasons that I just said, China has become a much more powerful nation. It is surely a great power, even if it's perhaps not yet a superpower quite on par with the United States. And what that means is that China is going to enjoy more influence over global politics. And the United States in many ways needs to accept that reality whether we're talking about China exercising greater influence in international institutions like the UN system, whether we're talking about China growing as a trading partner, both of countries in Asia, but also countries in Europe and around the world, whether we're talking about China's new development model exemplified by the Belt and Road Initiative, China is a tremendously powerful state and it is going to have quite a bit of influence over international politics. And the United States really needs to find a way to live alongside a more powerful China. But what our strategy tries to do is draw a bright line between those expressions of Chinese influence that are really a natural outgrowth of greater Chinese power and those types of Chinese behaviors that actually might represent bids for dominance. And when we're thinking about the warning flags for Chinese dominance and the way that it might be expressed. We could think about that in sort of traditional territorial terms. China might decide to use military force to conquer another state. It might try to use military force in order to fully annex Taiwan, for example. But it may also exert dominance in subtler 21st century terms, such as the use of 5G digital infrastructure to effectively coerce or undermine the political independence of other states, or the use of development lending and predatory lending as a way to undermine the political independence of recipient nations. So the task here is not to tit for tat pushback in a sort of zero sum sense on every incremental expression of Chinese influence wherever it might arise, but rather to identify those forms of Chinese foreign policy behavior that truly do threaten American interests and values and to develop clever strategies to push back against those. You know, one of the points that, that, that you raised is, you know, it, it seems to me that there has to be a new thinking and organizations are gonna have to be involved in this are the State Department, U.S. State Department, and the U.N. And neither one of these organizations have been very receptive for a very long time, if ever, to change. Jim, it is such an important point. And of course, one of those organizations is within the United States and the other one is without, but of course the U.S. has quite a bit of influence in the U.N. as well. So let me address both. There is no question that if the United States is to effectively compete with China and really effectively realize its own power and influence over the future of international order, we need to revitalize the U.S. State Department. One of the great errors of American foreign policy in the post-Cold War era has been an over-reliance on the use of military force as a leading instrument of American foreign policy. But the fact is, as we look forward, as we anticipate a world in which there's a growing consensus that military interventions, especially to change the regimes in foreign states are not a good use of American lives and money, as we seek to engage in a long-term competition with China that will actually not be primarily military in nature, but will unfold in the economic domain, commercially, technologically, and in some ways ideologically, this is a competition and this is a geopolitical landscape for which we need vigorous diplomacy. And then you layer on top of that, these set of transnational challenges, those that are so much on display right now as we live through the COVID pandemic, 
But as we anticipate recovering from COVID, as we anticipate the possibility of future pandemics, as we think about the existential threat by posed by climate change. This is, these are a set of challenges that are fundamentally political and diplomatic in nature. They entail mustering international cooperation among states that might not agree on much, but need to agree, for example, on the survival of our planet. And that is absolutely a role for the US State Department. So one of the key recommendations of the book is that the now Biden administration, um, incoming Biden administration needs to invest in revitalizing the State Department and really empowering it to be the leading instrument of American foreign policy in a way that it hasn't to date. Now, one of the tasks- Let me ask you, have you read the report that came out of Harvard that Mark Grossman and Nick Burns worked on? And what are your thoughts about it, if you've seen it? Uh, I've seen it. I haven't had the chance to read it uh, in depth right now, but there's a cons or quite yet, but there's a considerable amount of innovative thinking that is coming out, um, both of that report, the types of writing that Ambassador Bill Burns has done. There's a recent CFR report that came out recently about how to revitalize the State Department. Um, there are a lot of really venerable thinkers who've spent a tremendous amount of time at Foggy Bottom who have really gotten into the weeds and thinking about how everything from the decision-making process within de the department to the way in which its various bureaus are organized to the way that it recruits and retains personnel. All of these things are in desperate need of an overhaul. And so there's a lot of intellectual ferment right now in terms of shaping what that might look like. And it will be fascinating to see how the incoming Biden administration takes those proposals for state department reform and how under Secretary of State designate Tony Blinken, those ideas are put into practice. Go ahead, I think I interrupted you, you had another point. Oh no, that's okay. I was just gonna also speak to the UN question yeah, because certainly this is an instance where um, even as we're making the argument that the United States needs to lead new forms of international order, especially in un and under governed spaces, whether that's trade, especially digital trade or technology like 5G, AI, biotechnology, um, and so, or even climate change, pandemics, and so on, we still have an important use for these legacy institutions like the UN, but, but they do need to be reformed. And so one of the places that the UN in particular needs to be reformed is the UN Security Council. And it makes perfect sense when you think about it. This is a body of states that was assembled of the victors of World War II, a war that was over more than 70 years ago. And its composition simply no longer reflects the global distribution of power. And so it stands to reason that countries like India, which is likely to be one of the world's three largest economies by 2050, deserves a seat on the UN Security Council. I think you could also make a case for Japan and Germany. So this is just one of the places where these legacy institutions need to endure. They still serve important purposes, but precisely as you said, Jim, they really need to reform if they are to be effective in the 21st century. And I hate to point out our age difference, but I've been hearing that argument about reforming the Security Council, I think ever since I was a graduate student at the University of Virginia. It, it's, it's absolutely a fair point. It is something that has a long history in terms of its advocacy. And I'll be frank, I don't think that it's extraordinarily likely. And the reason why it's not likely is that countries like China and Russia don't have an interest in adding more democracies like India or Japan or Germany, all of whom are either allies or partners of the United States to the UN Security Council. And because it operates by consensus, that basically means that they have veto authority over the inclusion of those new states. Now, that doesn't mean that the U.S. shouldn't push for their inclusion, though, because part of what the United States needs to do is frame the choice for other countries, the choice between living within a world and an international order that is led by the United States and one that is led or even dominated by China. And here, India is a really interesting example, because as we argue in the book, India is really a hinge state. Yes, it is a democracy. It's also a country that shares a border with China. And given their military skirmishes in the Himalayas recently, there is a growing security competition between India and China. And India has come much closer to the United States as a security partner. But at the same time, under Prime Minister Modi, India in many ways has engaged in democratic backsliding and some of their preferences on matters of international order, and here you could think about internet governance, 
actually much more closely resemble China and Russia's vision of cyber sovereignty or state control over the internet than they do the United States vision, in many ways Europe's vision, of a free and open global internet. So we're going to be competing for the support of countries like India as we determine all these different elements of future international order. And I think fighting for India to be a member of the UN Security Camp Council and forcing countries like China and Russia to shoot down those proposals actually really sharpens the choice for such hinge states and helps us make the case that a US-led order is still the world that countries around the world want to be living in. You know, that makes good sense. Um, I only see two questions. Two of them from, are from uh, Ray Termini. Ray, nice to see you on the call. And I see how many people are on the call and I've also seen who you are and I know that you have good questions. So don't be hesitant. I have lots of questions. We can keep the discussion going, but because it's our global forum, I really wanna engage all of you in the call. Uh, one of the things I thought was interesting as well is about how we, you argue that we can no longer just say country X, you're democratic, you're authoritarian. We have to be more flexible in recognizing that countries may be one way domestically and another way globally. Elaborate on that if you would. So this is one of the big debates that foreign policy thinkers are having right now. Should the United States organize its foreign policy in terms of democracies versus authoritarian states, or are there other dividing lines that ought to be drawn that might be more strategically useful? And in the book, we come down on the latter side. We argue that the distinction between openness and closure, which is not the same as the, the distinction between democracies and authoritarians, is actually a more effective orienting principle for American foreign policy. And the reason for that is that democracies, to be sure, have generally strong preferences for openness. And so democratic countries should be the focal point of efforts to build new norms and standards and international cooperation led by the United States going forward. And I think this is in many ways the spirit of the summit for democracy or the summit of democracies that President-elect Biden has proposed. And we have many structures to do this, but we'll probably need new ones as well in order to, for example, build a coalition of techno-democracies that might be able to generate cost-effective alternatives to Chinese 5G technology. But we can't, oh, we can't stop just with the democracies. We also need to find ways to work with other states. So for example, as the United States is looking to develop international solutions to climate change, it's going to have to find ways to work with China as mutual interests do dictate in order to craft new forms of order and develop a new regime to address climate change or for that matter, to address pandemics. At the same time, as we're looking to push back against some forms of Chinese behavior in the Indo-Pacific region, the United States should not only limit itself to working with other democracies. You could think about a country like Vietnam, which is itself an illiberal state. It is not by any means a democracy, but it is a state with whom the United States shares substantial interests in keeping the South China Seas open. So the bottom line is that Americans strategists and foreign policymakers should not be overly picky about our partners. And the whole purpose of defining strategy in terms of openness is that it actually is a more inclusive construct, one that does have the possibility of bringing in mixed regimes or illiberal states, at least in some dimensions of future order. So you talk about other countries. What about other non-state actors? And, and again, in the book, uh, you, you, you raise the issue that the United States is really, government has not been very good at bringing in the private sector and there's a, a role for the private sector that needs to be, needs to be uh, increased. We make an argument that the United States needs to develop a new model of public-private partnership one that retains the dynamism of market forces and capitalist forces and the drivers of innovation that have made the United States so economically successful and competitive for so many years, but also that ensures that the interests of the private sector are aligned with the national interests and that they are directed towards similar foreign policy objectives overseas. So let me just give you the example of the US tech sector. So over the past several decades, since the end of the Cold War, US federal investment in R&D and basic science has taken a dramatic nosedive. 
Whereas in the 1970s, it was upwards of 2% of GDP. Today, it's actually less than 0.7% of GDP. And what that has meant is that in the absence of partnership with the federal government, Silicon Valley has gone out and chased foreign markets and foreign profits. And in many ways, the incentives of our tech companies have become decoupled from the national interest. We're often working at cross purposes. And this is something that can be remedied, but what it will take to remedy it, I think, is a big investment by the federal government in once again participating as the biggest player in R&D and basic science. It also means that we need to begin to break down the cultural barriers that exist between the tech sector and the federal government, making it easier for talent to flow easily between the public and private sector, developing these new forms of public-private partnership like the type of 5G consortium I just mentioned that actually unites many like-minded democratic countries and their tech sectors together in order to compete with China. You could also think about an AI consortium that would be an international public-private partnership. So again, as we anticipate a future in which many of the most important solutions to significant problems like climate change and pandemics require the cooperation of the private sector, as we've seen with the COVID vaccine race, and at a time when so much of competition with China will be commercial, economic, technological in nature, the United States really needs to find a way to harness its own power and capacity at home and direct it towards nationally defined strategic ends. And, and as you said, clearly Operation Warp Speed is a wonderful example of what, what can be accomplished. Uh, let me bring in Angela Kreitz into the conversation. Openness is great theoretically, she says, but that world order would most likely only work if trust exists. Could you please comment about how much you trust actions to follow words and agreements with other countries, primarily ones, uh, countries like China, Iran, et cetera? So this is not a strategy that is based on trust. In those areas where the United States would seek to cooperate or at least align with other countries um, such as China, Russia, or Iran, it would do so exclusively on the basis of mutual interests. So the United States and China may indeed have mutual interests in, for example, mitigating climate change, in, for example, reducing the risk of nuclear escalation if ever we find ourselves in crisis or wartime, much as the US and Russia have an abiding interest in at least some forms of arms control to mitigate nuclear risks between ourselves, and much as the United States, China, and Russia all have an interest in stemming nuclear proliferation around the world that can be destabilizing. Similarly, the U.S. shares an interest with China in, for example, keeping many of the global sea lanes open. If you think about the Straits of Hormuz off the coast of Iran, this is actually an area where Russia, China, the United States, the EU, India, and a number of other countries all work to protect freedom of navigation. So there are areas where mutual interests do converge, and that can be the basis for cooperation. It is not predicated on trust or assessment of benign intentions. And in fact, much of this strategy is actually designed to be a hedge against the likelihood that China does not have good intentions, that it may seek to dominate parts of the world, whether territorially or technologically. And that's why we need to craft coalitions that keep the balance of power in favor of openness. Uh, Ray Termini, you've been very patient. I just checked. You haven't texted me to say when I'm going to ask your question. So here we go. How should the U.S. re-engage with Iran? What should a new agreement with Iran include that was not included in the JCPOA? And I, I guess the question is, is what do you expect uh, President Biden to do um, uh, on this issue? Well, it seems fairly clear that President-elect Biden is interested in re-entering the JCPOA. Um, so long as Iran returns to compliance itself with the original dictates of the agreement. But of course, that JCPOA is not going to be enough. Even taken on its own terms, it always included a number of sunset provisions. And this being 2020, rather than you know, 2015, 2016, or 2017, uh, those sunset provisions are much closer to reaching 
their expiration dates. So this is a question of increasing the longevity of the agreement. It's a question of increasing the scope of the agreement to ensure that the United States retains verifiable means of ensuring that Iranian breakout time returns to something on the order of one year rather than just a few months as it is today. And also nesting the JCPOA within a set of understandings and ultimately perhaps agreements about Iran's destabilizing activity within the Middle East. So that, at least to my mind, is the set of objectives that a Biden team should be working towards. This would certainly represent a return to diplomacy, because I think it's pretty clear that the quote unquote maximum pressure campaign that the Trump administration has undertaken over the past four years has manifestly failed. We don't have a new deal. Iran is closer to having a nuclear weapon than it was when Trump came into office. Uh, there are no live diplomatic channels that were aware of that are pushing towards a new or better agreement. So it's time to go back to a formula that served us well and one that actually aligns with the preference, again, for diplomacy over the threat or use of military force as the means of advancing American interests cooperatively with allies and partners internationally. I want to bring into the conversation Steve Gardner from Baylor University. And he says, it's certainly true that the U.S. should try to cooperate with non-democratic countries on issues of mutual concern. But are you saying that we give no advantage to our interactions with other democracies? No, that isn't the argument. The argument is that, as I said before, democratic states are our most likely partners in defending openness because democratic countries tend to be open societies. They tend to favor open economies, open information spaces. And for all of those reasons, I would expect that democracies to really to be the foundational core of any coalitions for openness going forward. So democracies are vital. And of course, that is where we should start, especially as we think about creating new forms of governance, having to do with digital trade, or having to do with norms around the use of artificial intelligence, and so on. But like I said before, we don't want to be overly picky about our partners. And that's why it's important to retain an intellectual and a strategic construct that allows for the possibility of working alongside mixed regimes and illiberal states as mutual interests may dictate. In the book, uh, you have paragraphs, chapters uh, concerning how different countries would view your, your strategic uh, concept of openness. Uh, we don't have time to go through all of those, and that's a reason for people to get your book and, and read it soon. But let's talk about Russia. Where do they fit in? Because their strategy has is, is very different than China's, and certainly our response needs to be different. Absolutely. So if you zoom out and you think about the whole sort of global picture that we're painting in this book, it is a picture of a global battle in many ways that is underway between forces of openness and forces of closure. So to get to the original part of your argument, in essence, that battle has pitted democratic allies like Germany and Japan, who are trying to keep the world open, especially as the United States has retreated from its historic position as a defender of openness against authoritarian powers like Russia and China, which have in many ways become closer to each other and increasingly have been cooperating for closure. And then, of course, there are these countries like India that are in many ways hinge states that don't neatly fall in either camp. So Russia has been part of this team that has been advancing a vision of international politics that is more closed in nature, and that has been doing that in increasingly in concert with China as their cooperation deepens across a number of dimensions. Now, that manifests in a number of different ways. Clearly, Russia is interested in closing off a sphere of influence in its own near abroad. That was the motivation behind its actions in Ukraine, for example. This is something that the United States ought to oppose. It is something that Russia cannot achieve on the same scale that China can. Certainly, Russia cannot close off broad swaths of Eurasia by itself. It simply doesn't have the power to do so. But it has shown itself to be a pernicious actor that can undermine or spoil the European security order. And this is a challenge that the United States certainly has to respond to. Russia, at the same time, has undermined the political independence of other nations through election meddling, including in the United States' own election. This is something that the United States needs to take much more seriously as a fundamental assault on our democracy and something against which 
we need to push back. And finally, part of this strategy entails framing the Russia threat in terms of the type of cooperation that we need to have with our own European partners, including through NATO. Our book calls for a modernization of the NATO alliance so that the military forces are have greater readiness, are more capable of defending against the type of fait accompli attack that Russia may try to propagate, for example, in the Baltics, but also that the NATO and our NATO allies are prepared to deter and defend against this full spectrum of 21st century challenges, whether that's election meddling, whether that's cyber attacks um, and other forms of Russian bad behavior. So Russia in some is itself a challenge to openness, but because of its waning power, it's um, much, it's sort of declining economic capacity and so on. It doesn't present the same order of threat that China poses at a systemic level, um, but American strategy does need to remain attuned to the need to push back against any kind of Russian bid for closure and to do so in close partnership with our European allies. I want to ask you, you know, both you and Mira have written such a, um, I think I would say ambitious, proactive book. It certainly has been read by a number of policymakers, current and former. How are you, what are you doing in addition to talking to World Affairs Councils? What are you doing to, to uh, propel your ideas? Well, in many ways, our efforts to seed these ideas date to the very beginning of the project. We have always seen this as, of course, a book that Mira and I were researching, writing in the main together, but something that relied upon the expertise and input of a lot of different people. This is, as you said, an exceptionally ambitious project. It basically outlines a whole new blueprint for American foreign policy. And Mira and I, by virtue of our own personal expertise, could not possibly possibly cover the entire waterfront. So there are many, many people who contributed in, in different ways to the ideas that ultimately became part of this book and therefore I think maybe are also invested in our ultimate recommendations. But of course, course, we have published a number of articles. We've done quite a few briefings um, to senior policymakers and members of Congress of various stripes, um, you know, on the record, off the record types of events like this one. And of course, um, publishing pieces in a range of different popular and policy outlets, as well as uh, engaging in informal conversations with all sorts of different people. And I will say that one of the claims that we make in the book is that American strategy is being fundamentally undermined by the worsening partisan polarization that we see in this country, the way in which Democrats and Republicans are increasingly sorting into two opposing blocks, finding it more difficult to achieve common ground. And that polarization has really pernicious foreign policy consequences because it results in considerable volatility, as the White House changes hands between Democrats and Republicans, it undermines the credibility of our commitments to both allies and adversaries, making the United States seem like an unpredictable actor. And it also means that the loyal political bases of both parties are less likely to punish their leaders when they undertake irresponsible policy decisions, including foreign policy decisions. So, much as that trend is extraordinarily troubling and quite significant, I think, for the future of American foreign policy, I will say that over the course of writing this book and speaking about it since it came out in September, I've been heartened by the extent to which there are at least pillars of an openness strategy that do enjoy really substantial support, both amongst Democrats and Republicans at the elite level and also at the mass public level, um, which at least suggests that in the post-Trump era, there are some some bases upon which we can build a new bipartisan consensus about America's role in the world. You know, we have just a few minutes uh, left, unfortunately, and I want to be sure that uh, Tarek gets his question in. He's a senior at uh, Dallas International School. There's an influence war between the United States and China and Africa. In particular, China seems to be winning uh, uh, this war. Can you comment on that? This is an area where revitalizing American diplomacy and development is really crucial. And again, China has become a much richer and more powerful country. It is going to have more influence around the world than it used to. And the United States has to 
really adapt to that reality because it's not going to change anytime soon and there's nothing that we can really do to change it. So the key is to not view the expansion of Chinese influence in places like Africa or even in the Western Hemisphere as necessarily being zero sum in nature. But what we do need to do is we need to provide competitive alternatives, especially to Chinese development investment and infrastructure investment because we don't want countries in Africa to have to accept Chinese loans and Chinese projects with whatever terms they might come with simply by default for lack of any better alternatives. Rather, the goal of an open strategy is to create market diversity. Those countries should have options. If they choose China, they choose China, but they should also have transparent, good governance, more Western style development options when deciding to build up infrastructure as well. So improving infrastructure in developing nations, I think is a shared priority that many different countries have, and it'll be good in developing the markets there, which benefits America and Americans. And sometimes those projects will come at the hands of Chinese investment. But the really important thing, I think, is just to make sure that those bidding processes, those development projects are competitively assigned. And that would be the goal of an openness strategy. So I do wanna, um, because I think this is really a, a certainly timely question. And again, it's from uh, Ray. Do you regard the U.S. role in brokering the Abraham Accords as a step in the right direction? And it, news just broke a, a, about an hour or two ago that Morocco now is one of the, will be one of the uh, signatories to this. It does seem to be a step in the right direction. Certainly, there is a fascinating strategic realignment that is happening in the Middle East right now. I think American policy has something to do with it, but I also think the growing threat posed by Iran has quite a bit to do with it, as well as the sort of long-term uh, dysfunction, I think, that has beset the uh, Palestinians as a political actor. So I would expect to see a Biden administration try to build upon that success, while also, I think, holding Israel much more to account uh, than it has been over the Trump years, and frankly, also holding some of our Arab partners more to account than has been the case recently, especially on matters of human rights, the war in Yemen, and so on. So I think that this is certainly the basis for future progress, but I would expect to see American support for some of the participant nations to be a bit more conditional or at least conditioned than it has been recently. And I have to smile because we have two Tarek's among our membership, and I didn't see the last name, and Tarek is not at the Dallas International School. This is a man that's even a little bit older than I am, a wonderful um, uh, American uh, of Algerian heritage. So Tarek, great to have you on the call as, as well. So we have just a, a, another minute and uh, in your private capacity, what would you like to see the Biden administration, President Biden do announcements in those that on, 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 on January 21st? I remember well what President Trump did on January 21st. He, withdrew from uh, TPP, what would you like to see President Biden do? Will he, uh, what, what will be his first two or three steps that you'd like to see? Well, I think it's quite clear that the number one priority of a Biden administration has to be COVID response, both in terms of the vaccine distribution, which is now a good problem to have, but quite substantial, but also dealing with the economic recovery. So I think it's pretty clear that that is priority number one. But I also think it's exemplary of a type of approach to American foreign policy that we are likely to see in a Biden administration. We have historically thought of domestic and foreign policy as proceeding sort of in parallel and in somewhat different universes. But it's never been clear that America's international strength is actually fundamentally dependent on its domestic strength, whether we mean the health of our population, whether we mean having a sound immigration policy, whether we mean investing in the foundations of American innovation and competitiveness, everything from K-12 education to the type of high-end R&D and basic science investments that I was talking about before. And so one of the, I think, signature themes of a Biden presidency starting on January 12th is going to be this notion that there actually is no distinction between foreign and domestic policy, and that we need to really invest in the source of American strength at home, um, to include the democratic nature of our political system as really being the sort of fundamental basis for everything else that we might seek to accomplish in the world. 
and you said January 12th. I know he's anxious to get there, but we still got to wait another week. <laughs> <laughs> but I want to thank you so much for being with us. I've, I've thoroughly enjoyed the conversation, and I, I believe our members have as well. Uh, this is probably uh, our last uh, program for this year, unless something pops up. But I do want to remind folks to look at our website, dfwworld.org. We've got a lot of good programs coming up, especially for, for all of you in the Global Forum, which, of course, is supported by Lucy Billingsley. And I want to thank again, Gary Wollins for supporting today's program. Now, Tarek, I embarrassed you or, or maybe not. So I'm going to send you a, a book as, as a gift. And anybody who has a birthday this week, send me an email at, uh, I think most of you know my email address, jfalk at dfwworld.org. And we're going to send you a birthday present for anybody who has a birthday this week. Again, Rebecca, thanks so much for being with us. Everybody stay safe. And we'll see you next year, if not earlier. Oh,